then, let's get into the lesson. Today, our brick is asking. We're going to be asking, well, in our lesson today and in our homework through the week, I'm going to give you a lot of questions to be asking yourself, to be asking God. And remember that it's important to be asking the right questions. There are a lot of things that we need to know in this world, in this life, but if we're not asking the right questions, typically we'll never get the right answers. We might get answers, <laughs> but they're not really the ones we need to know. We're going to be asking a number of questions in here, and I'm going to give you a lot to go on with for your homework assignment, but the main one, they all kind of boil down to in this lesson is going to be got 10, and I'm going to start with a few other questions, and we're going to lead into explaining to you what that means. Got 10? First, remembering that training camp is about soaring, which is what the adult eagle does, soaring on the wind of the Holy Spirit so that it can get to the destination that the wind wants to take it to. But being an adult means that they're ones who are passing it on, feeding others. They're showing others how to fly. Our uh, verse, verses for this, is Isaiah 40, 30-31. through Youths may faint and grow weary, and young men stumble and fall, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. So you have the contrast between the youth, are the ones that grow weary, tired, stumble badly. But those who are soaring, obviously, then are the adults. They're waiting on God. They're listening. That's what we've been working on doing this whole series. That's the focus of all of it. So now... If we're going to be the adult eagle, and if we're going to be ones then who are passing this on to others, showing others how to do some things, then we've got to think about the specifics. How does that work? How should it work? How can it, how can it work in my life and everything that I do, I try to look at like a coach and break it down into small pieces, into something that's doable. As I've said numerous times, I know that in my life, I've taken these kinds of discipleship classes numerous times. I've taught these discipleship classes numerous times, and I did not do what they told me to do. I didn't read my Bible regularly. I didn't pray regularly. I didn't. I did go to church. You know, I did do some of them. And it wasn't that I didn't care or didn't want to. I didn't know how. Uh, the things that people were telling me weren't working for me. I was failing. And so there had to be some other way. When it comes to one of the things that they always talk about then is being a witness, sharing your faith with others, passing on. Well, I've tried that. I'm not going to say I was totally a failure at it. There were times, you know, people I was able to share with them. But overall, that just didn't work. So let's try to break it down into something doable, something that you can start with. I'm not going to start by sending you out on the street (laughs) and say, okay, don't come back until you've won five people to the Lord. (laughs) That would have an empty class, yes. So let's break it down. Starting with who's in your life. Look around. Who's in your life? And that's where we're going to start with Acts 1-8, which is starting of the church, becoming who they were supposed to be, of passing on what they were supposed to be. And it says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So I put in your book this little grid for you to think through. It's not something I'm going to ask you to talk to me about right now or fill out right now, but something for you in the weeks to come, and really for your whole life, to be asking, who's in my life? Believers and unbelievers. Because as we talked about that Jesus' one commandment that he gave us was make disciples, it wasn't go get people to pray the sinner's prayer. It was make disciples. Obviously, that starts with people getting saved, but then that's a lifelong process. He wants us to be passing on the skills of the faith so that we are learners and so that we're making other learners. Those three areas... Jerusalem, which is, as I've defined it, your comfort zone, your close family and friends. Then 
Judea Samaria would be kind of on the edge of your comfort zone. People you know a little bit better. Maybe you work with, but you're not real close with them. And then the uttermost. People are totally outside your comfort zone. And you see I've got it broken down into your Jerusalem, your comfort zone between believers and unbelievers, and Judea Samaria between believers and unbelievers. And I've got uttermost not divided up because if they're not at people you don't really know, you don't know. And that's one of the things that I have often done, and I'm you know, still trying to make myself do this, bring myself back to this, is when I get to know somebody, connect with somebody, a new neighbor, a new coworker, anything like that, one of the first things I often do is, Lord, help me to see and know, are they a believer or aren't they? If they're not, then my focus obviously is going to be praying for them to come to know salvation, to be able to be a witness in, in that regard. If they are a believer, then that still doesn't mean that I just say, oh, well, great. There's still some things I could be potentially passing on to them to help them become more of a disciple. Think about, as you're looking at this, to fill it out, who are your neighbors? Who are your coworkers? Who are the people you see regularly at the grocery store or at the school if your kids are in school or any other thing? And then who is there that you might just run into on the street that you totally don't know? And just be looking for filling this out so that then when we get to the other parts of this, you'll have a pool of people to work with. You'll recognize them. I'm sure you, we already do have a pool of people to work with, but sometimes it makes requires us to actually think about it that way, to see that, to be aware of that. Then the next question that we're going to look at is, who are you imitating? We looked at Philippians 3, 17, and Paul says there, Join in imitating me, brothers, and observe those who live according to the example you have in us. For this to be happening, first off, we need to be looking for somebody that we can imitate. Somebody who's doing these things. And I have to say, I've, you know, that's kind of been a lifelong focus of mine. And remember, though, or think about this, that, and this is your first fill in the blank, I'm not talking about just listening to someone, but actually walking with them, watching them live the life so that you can intentionally imitating them. We tend to not do this anymore in the church, at least not the ones I've been around. In spite of how hard we work at trying to set it up, every church I can remember being in is it has some sort of small group, life group, doing life together, and that's the intention. And they kind of work to some extent. They have certainly been a great blessing in my life. And what I have gotten, what I have learned, has been primarily through that, not from teaching, preaching. So this needs to be someone who's out ahead of you, at least in some areas, but not so far ahead that you can't actually do things with them. This is not the pastor for most of us. Who did you do discipleship with this week? Not just listen to someone talk about it. Who did you do evangelism with this week? Who did you serve with this week? Who did you pray with this week? Not what book did you read about evangelism or discipleship or serving or praying? Not what teacher did you watch or listen to who talked about evangelism, discipleship, serving, and praying? Some of this is as far as looking to identify the people in our life. I got from the Billy Graham My Hope thing, from that discussion. And that whole thing, going through it, didn't turn out like I expected. But it did have a huge value because in, those, in doing those things, There was a group of people that we were being accountable to, that we were throwing out ideas with, that we were watching each other, and we did, Todd and I did, have a couple of people over and invited a number of people. A couple of them came. We did do the Billy Graham thing. Didn't have anybody say, oh, yes, I'm going to sign on the dotted line and become a Christian, but I'm convinced that we planted a seed, and now these are friends. These are not just people that we corralled into our home for one day. These are people that we're going to have an ongoing relationship with, and so we're going to plant some more seeds, and we're going to keep praying for them. 
but I really believe that, that the biggest part of that whole thing was it pushed me to do these kinds of things, to be looking for those people in my life, not for an event, that just one event that I could hopefully get them to pray the sinner's prayer, but to be looking at this as a lifelong thing, to be passing on whatever I've got. And then, of course, who is imitating you? Remember from the introduction to this that an eagle, which is what we're aiming for in this, that an eagle can't talk, can't explain, can't draw draw diagrams on chalkboards. I love my PowerPoint and I love my whiteboard. (laughs) But it's bottom line, it's not about that. An eagle can't do that, and yet somehow an eagle gets a young eagle to learn how to fly, to learn to feed itself, to get out of the nest and be on its own. So the adult has to do things to try to encourage the young eagle to emulate them. We also talked about the fact that what I learned when I looked that up is that an eagle teaches a young eagle to fly not by, or at least I didn't find any place that it said that they pushed them out of the nest or anything. What they did was withhold food. They fed them, fed them, fed them until they started getting old enough, and then they came back with food that held it just out of reach. So the eagle is doing this. It's like, <laughs> and learning. It's like, hey, this kind of <coughs> feels kind of cool, you know? And then they hold it a little further, and then at some point they just stop feeding them. And then the eagle says, hmm, <coughs> Where'd he go? (laughs) There's got to be something out there. And then teaching them, once they get out of the nest, teaching them to feed themselves. It's got to be the same thing. The adult eagle just does it in front of the young eagle, and the young eagle tries it, and it probably doesn't work so well at first, but they keep trying it because they're hungry. So we need to be working on thinking about not what can I tell people, But what can I do in front of them? And this is really, it's not a fill in the blank because it's really all the same stuff from before. Not just (coughs) listening to us, not but actually letting them walk with you and watch you live the life so they can imitate you and me. I have seen something in Scripture, and I think it's really um, encapsulated well in Judges 2, 6 through 12. It says there that the people worshipped the Lord throughout Joshua's lifetime and during the lifetimes of the elders who outlived Joshua. They had seen all the Lord's great works he had done for Israel. Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. And the whole generation, that whole generation was also gathered to their ancestors. After them, another generation rose up who did not know the Lord or the work he had done for Israel. The Israelites did what was evil in the Lord's sight. They worshipped the Baals and abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers. They didn't see it. They heard about it. This is about doing something observable. It's our responsibility to tell the next generation about God and about his mighty work. But it's not enough unless it compels them to seek God for themselves. Whenever we get a generation that's only heard about God's greatness that hasn't experienced it, complacency is not far behind, and then evil not far behind that. It may not be us, quote-unquote, doing the evil, but our power failure, in a sense, our lack of that continued personal close connection with God creates a vacuum that allows that evil to just be sucked in and and take over. That's what I just read to you about. And I believe that's what we see happening in our nation today and so many of those places of the world. We've heard about it. I've I've said this myself. There's a scripture that I actually use as a prayer. It's in Habakkuk. It says, we've heard about your great works, Lord. Now renew them in our day. And it's a valid prayer. But... I think I need to, and what I work on is, okay, in me, God. Renew your works in me, God. And it has to start with just getting to know him, being close to him. And that's where we're really going to go with this, especially we're going to look at 
a couple of situations with Abraham, again, and particularly with Lot. And here's where we get to who's imitating you, again, who's your ten? Genesis 18 is the story that you're probably pretty familiar with where God comes down and talks to Abraham and talks about a lot of different things, but almost like an aside after he's done renewing covenant with him and talking about you're going to have a, the son's going to come that I promised. The men got up from there, apparently two angels and God, and looked out over Sodom and Abraham was walking with them to see them off. Then the Lord said, should I hide what I'm about to do from Abraham? Abraham is to become a great and powerful nation and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him so that he will command his children and his house after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. This is how the Lord will fulfill to Abraham what he promised. Then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is immense and their sin is extremely serious. I will go down to see if what they have done justifies the cry that has come up to me. If not, I will find out. And then there's the famous negotiation between Abraham and God. Will you really, in verse 23, will you really sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? And God agrees, says, okay, if I find 50 righteous people, I won't destroy it. And then Abraham says, well, you know, how about if you only find 45? And how about if you only find 40? And how about if you only find 30? And finally, he gets them down to 10. The whole two cities, we don't know if there were hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands of people, but those whole two cities could have been spared for 10 righteous people. I've... I've heard people preach on why did Abraham stop at 10? Don't know, but it kind of seems reasonable to to surmise that Abraham was thinking, okay, my nephew Lot's been there. I know he's, he's a righteous person. I know he's got a wife. He's got two daughters. Probably by now his daughters are married. Maybe they have some kids. Well, maybe he's got surely by now. He's got at least 10 people that he's shared you with, that he's brought along with him. But I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself because what I want to talk about here to begin with is, does God check with you before he does something? This is astounding to me. And I can't say that you see it a lot in Scripture, but it obviously is possible. God actually checked with Abraham about what he was about to do and gave Abraham the opportunity to affect the outcome. And you think, okay, but that was that was Abraham. He was one of the big guys. He was a big shot. That's not the way God wants to work with just little old me. Well, look at James 2.23, and this again, talks about Abraham. It says, the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness and he was called God's friend. And we remember that. Abraham, the friend of God. Well, look what Jesus said in John 15, 13 through 15. No one has greater love than this that someone would lay down his life for his friend. You are my friend. If you do what I command you, I do not call you slaves anymore because a slave doesn't know what his master is doing. I have called you friends because I've made known to you everything I've heard from my father. That's the model. That sharing, that connection for us to have with God, and it's not that God's going to tell us everything he's ever going to do with everybody, but he wants to have that relationship for us, with us, with maybe... Our our Sodom and Gomorrah, our area of connection. So then we're going to look at what happened. I know you guys know this. We're going to read it. But just to start with, what I was saying about why did Abraham stop at 10, don't know for sure, but you think about, okay, Lot's one. He had one wife. He had two daughters. They do, we know, had two betrothed fiancés. So how many more would, if he had those six, all he would have had to 
Watt would have had to get four more people to be in the category of righteous to have saved these two whole cities. But what happened? Genesis 19, we know the angels came to Lot, told him what was going to happen. Uh, they had all that rigmarole with the attacks and everything and barely saving their lives. The angels said, do you have anyone else here? A son-in-law, your sons, daughters, anyone else in the city who belongs to you. Get them out of this place. For we're about to destroy it because the outcry against it has been so great. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law who were going to marry his daughters. Get up, he said. Get out of this place for the Lord is about to destroy the city. But his sons-in-law thought he was joking. So in our equation, he really didn't even have the two betrothed. So now it's maybe six he needed. At daybreak, the angels urged Lot on, Get up, take your wife and your two daughters who are with you, or you will be swept away in the punishment of this city. But Lot hesitated. Because of the Lord's compassion for him, the men grabbed his hand, his wife's hand, and the hands of his two daughters, and they brought him out and left him outside the city, and they told him to run away, which they did. But as you also, I'm sure, remember, Lot's wife turned around, looked back, and turned into a pillar of salt. So not only were there not the ten that would have saved the two whole cities, Lot really only got out with himself and his two daughters. That's it's so sad. But we need to be careful not to just look at this and say, oh yeah, that was them. That has nothing to do with me. Instead, we need to ask ourselves this question, who's your pen? If a small group of righteous people can have an impact on God's outcome for a huge place, then we don't need to be focused on trying to win the world, we need to focus on, who's my ten? Are there ten people around me that God has put in my life that I can actually influence and bring along? As we think about this, we just need to ask ourselves, not only who's our ten, but are you doing something about it? Again, the Philly Graham thing was very, very, very valuable, even though it had nothing like the impact I thought it was going to have in the lives of us personally and the people we know and in our church. But it has really pushed me to see this, to begin something that, and I remember Richard Taylor saying that evangelism is not about an event, it's a lifestyle. It's got to be a lifestyle where we are looking not just to live our own quiet, happy lives, but there are people out there that I have a connection with that I need to be looking at. How can I influence them? Whether to get them saved to begin with or whether they're saved but they're just kind of living without any real direction or without any real focus, how can I influence them? To bring this home, this is something that really stood out to me a, a while ago when I read this. I want you to compare Lot with Paul. And you might not see any necessary connection with them, but I saw something a while ago when I was reading Second Peter 2, 4 through 9, and then something I was reading shortly after that about Paul in Acts 17, 16 through 17. And I'm going to read those now, and I want us to look at these and fill these out as we're going through this. In Second Peter 2, it's talking, uh, Peter's talking about judgment, and he's saying that people are going to face judgment. If he reduced the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes and condemned them to ruin, making them an example to those who were going to be ungodly. And rescued righteous Lot, distressed by the unrestrained behavior of the immoral. For as he lived among them, that righteous man tormented himself day by day with the lawless deeds he saw and heard. Look at that now. We'll go on to Paul in a minute. But for now, it says, first of all, that Lot was a righteous person. What does it say his reaction was to the ungodliness around him? In the Holman, it says distress. Did he care about what was going on around him? Yeah, he cared. He was tormented, oppressed, sick about it. Does that feel like anything we might feel these days? Then the question, though, is, and you might not 
see it immediately that these are two separate things, but what was his action? This was how he felt about it. This was what it made him think and feel. What did he do about it? So Holman says he tormented himself. It's clear to me that he did nothing. And it's, in all the translations I looked it up in, except for one, it says things like, that man vexed his soul from day to day. He stewed over it. The Amplified says he tortured his soul. But those are all internal things, aren't they? That's just, oh, this is awful. Somebody's got to do something. Instead of like, oh, maybe I'm the one. So what was the result? And you don't see that here, but, well, you kind of do. But we know what the result was. Destruction. I mean, absolute destruction. Not just the lack of a culture. Fire and brimstone burned the places to the ground. Nobody's ever known for sure where these places are. So nobody can say this size city or whatever. But two cities, you think... We've got to be talking at least tens of thousands of people, maybe hundreds of thousands of people, destroyed. God had said to Abraham, this is what I'm going to do. Abraham had managed to negotiate God down to, if there are even ten righteous people in the land, you'll save them, won't you? You'll protect all of them, won't you? And God said, yes. Not even ten. This righteous man tormented himself, was distressed over it, vexed his soul, tortured his soul, but accomplished nothing. Look at Paul in Acts 17, 16 to 17. And what connected these two with me was to begin with Paul's reaction to the ungodly. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was troubled within him when he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with those who worshipped God, and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Okay, so what was Paul's reaction? Deeply troubled. They were both really affected. They were really in anguish about the ungodliness around them. What did Paul do? He preached. This has held discussions, I think, uh, one of them, yeah, reason. And then go to verses 32 through 34 to see the result. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some began to ridicule him. But others said, we'd like to hear from you again about this. Then Paul left their presence. However, some men joined him and believed. Some. Some believed. Doesn't say thousands, does it? We have a tendency, I think, to look at the beginning of Acts and see where Peter preached the day of Pentecost, and then after that, we see the 3,000, we see the 5,000, and we think, wow, yeah, that's where we're supposed to be. And for some people, yeah. That is, that's what they're supposed to do. But it wasn't what, typically that was not said of Paul. We tend to look at those two incidences in the beginning of Acts, and we think it's all about the thousand. And that then is in the category or in the uh, area of responsibility of the preachers and the evangelists and the missionaries and those sorts of people. Paul, who is known as an evangelist, who wrote most of the New Testament, Most of the times that you see him, he does this. He lives with people. He's the one that wrote in Philippians what we read, imitate me. Observe those who are imitating and you imitate. If Paul had done the same sort of thing in Sodom and Gomorrah, all of Sodom and Gomorrah could have been saved. We need to look at this Bringing it down, back to my question, got ten? Who's your ten? Ten people. If each one of us were to impact ten people, it would have an incredible impact 
on the kingdom of God. Think about this then. Who's your 10? And like I said, break this down into, okay, what do I do about that? First of all, think about a situation that you might be in, people that you might know, who would follow you? Would there even be 10 who would follow you in doing something that would totally and irrevocably alter their future just because you said they needed to? And they'd follow you because you've been living a life of being spirit-led in front of them and they've seen your track record. Are we waiting on God to judge America? Is God waiting on us to get even a small group of people to follow us toward righteousness? In order to have this ten, ten people who might follow us, there are a number of things required. First one is that you have to be in the loop. You've got to be listening to God. Because there have been plenty of people, haven't there, who have gone on before us and said, the world is going to end. And I'm not saying go out there and say that to people. I don't know. I don't know what God has planned for next year, 10 years down the road. It sure looks like we are on the edge of what we deserve, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. But I've got to listen to God. Not worry about the nation, but worry about my area. The 10, maybe that God has said, these ten. You'd have to have some people who have been watching you and found you trustworthy. And for all that to happen, to have a chance that someone would follow you at some point in the future when the need is critical, there's one very, very, very important thing. You have to start now. With the things that we've been talking about with the things that we've been working on first of all is yourself being connected with God learning to hear God's voice learning to follow him doing some trial and error yes and maybe falling flat on your face and letting people see that and see that you get back up again and you go again and you're practicing so that you're learning to really know that you know that you know that you recognize God's voice and so that if and when something happens that you really need to tell somebody and they really need to follow you, that you'll know and they'll know. And regardless of whether that that kind of scenario really happens, this is the kind of thing that will change the direction of our nation. This is the kind of thing that will grow the kingdom of God is if each one of us takes responsibility to pass it on to a few other people. Thinking about this, who's imitating you? The fact is that there is a tug of war. You think of this group of people, you're somewhere in that mix, and you have this group of maybe ten people around you that you have connections with. Devil's trying to pull all everybody one way, the God's trying to pull everybody the other way. There's this tug of war going on. You need to look at this and think, first of all, just kind of an obvious question, but where are you in this pack of people? Are you way out there close to God? Are you way back there close to the devil? You have to ask yourself that, but that's not really the most important question. I think the most important question is, which way are you moving? Because we are moving. This is all about growth. We may think that we're not moving, but we are. Day by day, moment by moment, we're going with God. We're getting closer to him or we're getting further away from him, which means we're getting closer to the devil. It's not an intentional thing, not saying, oh, yes, I have turned and I love the devil now. It's just what happens when we're not focused on and working on making sure we're getting closer and closer and closer to God. And then, of course, who are you taking with you? We looked at Matthew 28, 18 through 20, which is the commandment that Jesus left his disciples 
All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe or do, most translations say, everything I've commanded you. And remember, I'm with you always to the end of the age. To be a disciple, we saw, means to be a learner. To get other disciples, other people to become disciples, we just need to keep learning. Keep being learners and let them watch us being learners so that they can be learners. So we can be moving closer to God. We can be taking some other people with us. And with that, the important thing is that you, I, each one of us, has an assignment. I don't know if it's ten people. I don't know if it's two people. I don't know if it's a hundred people. But just to get you to think about the fact that ten people could make a huge difference, Jesus said in John 17, 18, and 20, as you, he's praying, he says, as you, God, have sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And I pray not only for these, but also for those who believe in me through their message. Jesus is saying, I got these disciples, now I'm sending them out so that others will believe in me because of their message. And Ephesians 2.10, we tend to focus on Ephesians 2.8 and 9, which says that you're saved by grace through faith, it's a gift of God, not works so that anyone, no one can boast. And in verse 10 it says, For we are his creation, created in Christ Jesus, for good work, which God prepared ahead of time so that we should walk in them. He's prepared a work, or work, for each one of us. And our goal, our plan, our need is to walk in them. We each have an assignment. Looking through these kinds of questions that I've already talked to you about, who's around you, who's in your Judea, who's in your Samaria, who's in the othermost, who are the believers, who are the unbelievers, those are the kind of questions you need to be asking yourself and talking to God about to know who's my assignment. And then, obviously, we need to do something about it, not like what, and just be in anguish over it, but not do anything. So as I said, it's about growth. It's about going closer. Back to our keys to effectiveness. Key number one from 2 Peter 1.8 was it's growth. It's about growth, not maturity, not some level that we we reach and we think we're good. The In our tug-of-war example there, it's not so much your location, but your movement. Are you moving closer to God or to the devil? Do you have five years' experience in Doing things for the Lord, or do you have one year experience that you've repeated five times? You just keep doing the same thing over and over again, and you're not really getting any growth, you're not getting any results. Did you reach a level of acceptable maturity, and now you're just kind of camped there? Because, hey, this is pretty good. I'm safe. I'm good. I'm not falling into any horrible sin. I'm serving. I'm doing things. And then, who are you taking with you by example, by encouragement, by carrying, by pushing them to try some things on their own while you watch and help growth? And then remember, key number two was all about little things. Luke 16.10 and Matthew 25, little things lead to big things, and little things, being faithful in little things, God gives us responsibility for bigger things. And then today's, Key number three is that being consistent is more important than volume. Being consistent in little things is more important, and this is where I fell flat on my face for so much of my life, Christian life, doing some big thing that I would make some great effort and spend a lot of time and focus, and I was so exhausted I didn't do it again for another five years. (laughs) I mean, that's just the reality. I, I read the Bible through. I remember as a new Christian reading it, I would cut classes and sit in an empty room and read the Bible. I read and read and read and read and read, and I know I read all of it. But then when it came to regularly, daily reading my Bible, I never got that habit until, until I broke it down to focusing con- on consistency, not volume. Matthew 24, 45 through 47 says, And this is, again, the faithful slave, the faithful servant, kind of like we looked at a similar uh, parable that Jesus told in Matthew 25 for little things. It says, who then is a faithful 
and sensible slave whom his master has put in charge of his household to give them their food at the proper time. That slave whose master finds him working when he comes will be rewarded. There's a consistency in that. The master finds the servant. Just keep doing it. Just keep doing it. Doing what I was told. Doing what I was told. Doing what I was told. It says then, that slave whose master finds him working when he comes will be rewarded. I assure you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions like we talked about last time. If you want to have authority, if you want to have a place for God to use you in the kingdom of God, you've got to be faithful in some little things. You've got to be consistent. Here I think it's neat because it talks about feeding. This slave has been in charge, put in charge of a household to feed them while the master's gone. What do you think? Do you think if the slave put out six tons of food the first day and, let it, and then just walked away, would that have been what the master meant? No. Cook them a meal three times a day for however many days I'm gone. Not a ton all at once, but a little consistently. And when the master comes back, if I find you doing what I've told you to do consistently, faithfully, then I'm going to put you in charge of all my possessions. And he uses the word faithful. And in 1 John 1, 9, if we want to know what faithful means, it says, if we confess our sins, he, God, is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If God forgave our sins 99% of the time, would we be okay with that? Would that be faithful? No. Faithful is doing it. Repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly. And as we do that, then we can grow. Then we can expand. Then we can make it a bigger deal. Your assignment for the next week. I told you this is all about asking the right questions so you'll get the right answers. So we're going to continue living like a true disciple. First of all, our exercises this week are kind of focused on prayer reflection. We've got to be talking to God about some of these things. So when we ask these questions, we're not just asking them of ourselves to figure them out. We're asking God. We're going to continue doing our daily Bible listening so we'll get that practice in hearing God. We're going to continue to praise God and pray in the Spirit so we're making sure our satellite dish is aimed at Him. And then we're going to do so a lot of asking and listening. And I have for you, I won't read them all, but I have a ton of questions. And they're just to provoke some thought for you. You've got the first thing I showed you, the um, table there to think about who's in your life. And then all these questions are aimed at asking you to think about whether you've got 10 people that you could be influencing. If you haven't got 10, that's okay. Start with one. Start somewhere. If you've already got 10, great. Get 10 more. It's not a goal that we get to and we say, oh, great, I'm good. It's just a, a target that we can start with. Pray for God to show you your assignment. Ask him questions like I've got down here. And, and when we started this training camp, I told you that I expected this one to be much harder, to have much higher expectations. And, and this is where it really starts to happen. I'm asking myself these questions. And you may not have an answer to all of them. Some of them are just kind of rephrasing the same thing. It's okay, but it's just to get your thinking. So each day, maybe try to answer a few of these questions or talk to God about a few of them. Ask yourself these tough questions because the focus of all of them is who's your 10? Your group of 10 people that you could influence, that you might be able to get to follow you if it was necessary. As you see at the end of the questions, I've got a little paragraph. It says, answering these questions is going to be foundational for the goal of this training camp because you're going to need to start an Eagles group. Is nothing more than get together, do Bible listening together, and talk about God saying this to me, this is what I'm doing. It's doing life together, learning to hear God and follow. And you be the one, not just me who says not, oh, yeah, I've learned all this and this is how it's done and you've got it all figured out. But no, yeah, I'm doing this. I'm trying it. Maybe I've gotten this far and this is what I've learned or maybe I haven't learned anything, but I'm still trying. Be an example. Be imitatable. Let somebody see you living the life, not perfectly, but growing. Focus has got 10. 
got a destiny, got an assignment. All these things are things that you should continue to be thinking about and looking at, asking God to help you, and thinking about who's your 10, and start at least one to move towards getting that.